Um, secondly, um, or not secondly, but another, another option is, you know, infrastructure, you know, water, power needs, depending upon how you plan to heat these guys, uh, be it propane or, or IR uh, or even incandescent. Uh, make sure you have good clean water availability, uh, feeding solutions, and again, you know, bedding, you know, so bedding is a, um, <laughs> it, I wish it was a four letter word, but it's not. Uh, Bedding is one of the things that you know, we all struggle with, um, and I and I feel like you know it's it's you know depending upon what compostable materials you have available to you locally, it may be a different solution. Obviously, wood chips or peat moss or rice holes. There's a lot of different uh, things out there that you can use. Um, there's even a hemp product out there. So you know, bedding is a uh, is another thing we'll talk about here. Um, and lastly, a couple of things on our list, number nine and 10, actually are really important. Um, human access uh, to your brooder is super, super important. You need to be able to get in there uh, and not have to step on a chick, you know what I mean? You know, or a pole or whatever you're brooding. Uh, so you need to have access to the, you know, to that brooder. You need to be able to get to your feed and water, keep things clean. Um, and so you need to really think about your entry and exit points um, as a farmer. Um, and then lastly, uh, observation, uh, you need to be able to observe the, the, the inhabitants of your brooder without them knowing that you're there. So this will allow you to make, you know, good observations about specifically like heating, for an example, to see how they're gathering, uh, or to see other potential stresses that they may be encountering. You know, if a big giant farmer walks in there, they're going to only see you. But if you are hidden and they can't see you, then you'll see the other stresses that they might be, you know, be dealing with. So that's real important. Um, so that's kind of a quick run through. Dave, I, I don't want to uh, steal this uh, time here. I'd love for you to also, if you have any of these points that you want to emphasize, um, you know, uh, please, why don't you hop on in there? Okay. I, I, did, I did make a couple notes as you were going through. Um, and Dave, I apologize. Uh, it, is this is this an overview, or, or would this be a good time for me to emphasize some of those? If if this is a good time, I don't know. I couldn't. Uh... Well, this is. I guess this is kind of an overview, and you know, because this course is kind of geared towards you know entry brooding. But as I looked at the participant list, we have a lot of uh, tenured farmers on this list too. So mm -hmm. I feel like um, we probably are good to digress in some areas as well uh, where they might benefit. And then of course, you know, uh, you know, that's just my thoughts. Okay. Well, I, I've got a couple digressions, but feel free to grab me by the leash and pull me back in line here. Um, first of all, talking about enough space to accommodate the number of chicks. Um, I, I'll put a number at it. Some people will say a, a full square foot per bird. Um, I, I go out to pasture fairly early. I, I use the number of a half a square foot per bird. But the main point I want to make on this is that usually as you're scaling up this is where you will get burned because you'll have a brooder and it'll great work great for 100 chicks and the next year you put 200 chicks in it and the next year you put 300 chicks in it and you may um use more you know you may build more pasture pens but you forget to add brooder space and then and then pretty soon you have some smaller not healthy chicks coming out of the brooder um so that's a point on that. Um, on, uh, on watering systems, um, I, I think Dave mentioned how important it was to keep the bedding dry. And whatever your watering system is, you need to keep that in mind. Um, I like a closed water system with nipple drinkers. I could go into detail about that. There's, there's some details. They're different. The main thing is you have to keep the pressure low but that, in my experience, that's helped keep the bedding dry and also um, kept water contamination because they're a closed system. Birds can't scratch uh, bedding material into waters and, and get contamination that way. And, um, and then keeping the bedding dry is, is a big point of keeping the air quality in the brooder strong. And I think we've got something to talk about ventilation later on. Um, but when you get bedding wet, it brings problems for um, 
just betting quality and chicks, you know, diseases pass more readily, uh, but it also really has a strong effect on, um, on air quality in the brooder as well. Um, and then back to the question of how, how a brooder space, I think the first way to tell that you don't have enough brooder space is, that, is if the manure starts capping over. Um, you can clear capped manure out. Um, it's a bit labor intensive, uh, but as a rule of thumb, if your manure starts capping over, I, I would say you've got too many chicks or keeping them for too long in the brooder. All right, that was my digressions. You can <laughs> pull me back in line there. Uh, those are great, perfect. Now that's, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Um, I think, you know, so the brooder is kind of like this spurious thing. A lot of people talk about it. Uh, and when you say brooder, I think everybody's gonna have a different, uh, a, you know, they're gonna have a different idea of what that might be. However, you know, before we kind of get into that, which I think we have a lot of talk about there, uh, I wanna talk about this chart on this current slide. Uh, this is something that would really help and aid your ability uh, to design your brooder. And it really should be kind of the, the basis, no matter what style brooding system or brooder you go with, these principles are gonna be pretty much real important. And this kind of dovetails back into what you were talking about, Dave, with you know, space per inhabitant, uh, you know, total square feet and uh, temperature requirements. And even as you get a little bit more advanced, uh, you know, ventilation requirements. Um, so uh, this, this uh, particular chart, you can see where we break it down to the one, two, three, and four week uh, requirements. Uh, this this kind of is based on like, you know, environment. This is like, you know, kind of like I mentioned in the very beginning, your environment's gonna really dictate how long your chicks are gonna stay in your brooder. And so uh, for an example, uh, you know, here in Florida during the right time of the year, I mean, we might be, seven to 14 days before they're out of the brooder. And so our square foot requirement for depending upon the size and groups of chicks that we're gonna brood uh, is gonna be quite a bit less. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, you know, say at two weeks, you know, I'm showing that you want, you know, you know, a half a square foot per occupant. So if you have a hundred birds, you're looking at 50 square feet. Uh, and then if you go, you know, across that list, you'll see, you know, the temperatures we're looking for at bedding level, you know, from your heating sources. So, you know, 95 degrees at the first week, 85 to 90 the second. Um, and then again, further to the right, uh, your air exchange, you know, your CFM air exchange per occupant. So what that does is when you, um, you know, when you have a large number of chicks in a brooder, you know, they build up moisture very quickly. Uh, we particularly noticed this issue uh, with our turkeys, you know, turkeys just were high moisture environment. So it was real important for us to circulate air in that brooder. Uh, and so again, that's another design requirement that you will want to consider, you know, when you're building something, you know, be it a fixed structure, you know, a trailer, mobile, uh, connex, you know, whatever it is you're going to do. Um, so these, you know, these requirements, you know, are really universal. So I see we have some questions coming in and I would really like to uh, maybe, you know, take these questions as we go, because I think some of these are definitely pertinent, uh, you know, to, what, to what's being discussed. Um, kind of back on your, your bedding statement there, Dave, uh, we have some questions about uh, manure and bedding and keeping bedding dry. Uh, so if you wanna talk maybe about how you help keep your bedding dry with your watering system, um, I can add some, you know, things that we've done as well. Sure. So I've scrolled up a little bit and I see some of this, some of the questions here. Uh, first one, uh, do, do I recommend sand for bedding? Um, and I don't. I, I've actually tried it and it's, it, it caps over extremely quickly. Um, uh, you just, you need the carbon material there to be able to absorb the ammonia. And then just a little bit of uh, ventilation too, kind of a little bit of fluffiness to it so the air can get over, uh, get under it and keep things dry. Um, so question about what capping over means. So, um, especially with broiler chick, chicks, um, they're eating a lot of feed and they're producing a lot of manure. And as long as uh, the, they're more spread out, the manure kind of falls down into the bedding, uh, dries out and, and kind of gets incorporated into the bedding. 
And so the wood chips get less and less clean as they go along, but they still look like wood chips. The manure is just sort of incorporate, dried out and incorporate into the bedding. If at some point, if the chicks are too crowded uh, or if it gets wet, there's some other things, but generally if chicks are too crowded, um, the manure is coming in so fast that it, it forms sort of a sheet on top and is not incorporated into the bedding. And, and that's, that's what in our terms we would say capping over. The manure has in a, in a given area, and usually it's gonna be around the waters, around the feeders, or if your temperature is not quite right and they're huddled in a corner or something like that, or, or, or you just, your brooder's not large enough and, and they're, they're crowded because there's just not enough room, uh, the manure will actually build up into a sheet. And when that happens, and it's because it kind of forms into a sheet, it's not able to mix into the bedding. And, and it's also where a lot of disease transfer will happen. Um, let's see. I see a question about using a cleaning agent when changing out manure between groups. Um, that, that is a very uh, good question. As of right now, um, I do have an issue, a disease in the flock that I'm trying to work through and make sure I get purged out. So as of right now, every time I do take chicks out the pasture, um, I am cleaning it and either using a, a bleach solution or a chemically available um, disinfectant to clean the house out ahead of time. Um, I know others have worked with it where they'll do maybe three batches uh, through and then do a clean out where they clean out. I think the most important thing is actually the wash as opposed to the disinfectant, making sure you, you, you get all the old bedding out and then like the dust and things that are in the building, make sure make sure you get it clean. I would say cleanliness would be more important than disinfection. Um, but I know also there's some benefit, and, and I've heard a lot of people say, you know, that somewhere around three batches is a good number because there's going to be some healthy bacteria, uh, or, or at least other bacteria that's going to build up in the bedding that's going to keep the other uh, pathogens in check. So I'm not saying that always is the best answer to clean out every time. That's what I'm currently doing. And I do think cleanliness is very important. And if you have a disease that you're, you're trying to shake, then I would say using a, a bleach or other disinfectant would, and I know we're most of us sort of working in organic or pseudo organic sort of space, but uh, sometimes you really need to get a disease uh, kicked and um, disinfection when the chicks are not in there seems to me to be appropriate. Yeah, the, um, you know, just in addition to that, I know, you know, the life cycle of a broiler, for an example, is, you know, seven weeks uh, to eight weeks. And a lot of times some of the disease that impacts chicken doesn't really have time to mature in that short of time. Uh, so normally it's going to be more, uh, I, I guess you can say, immediate issues like coxie, things of that nature that might, you know, involve bedding issues. Uh, so I think, you know, this is uh, this is something that uh, we definitely want to do. So, you know, keeping, keeping that clean, clean and keeping the water from uh, causing capping in the brooder is certainly important. Uh, and also, uh, you know, in our case, we found that adding cups underneath the water nipple drinkers has helped tremendously and help keeping uh, the bedding dry. Um, also, we kind of triage bedding, so to speak. And what I mean by that is we go out there and literally scoop out wet spots and replace it with dry bedding. So we, we don't really look to try and create a whole new layer uh, in the brooder. We try just to kind of triage areas that, that you know, have heavier loads. Hey Dave, I had a question from somebody that um, asked, what temperature range do you use in the brooder for chicks and does it matter? Uh, it definitely matters uh, for sure. Uh, we we want to, uh, you know, keep those guys warm. So, you know, chicks, obviously, when they're hatched out, you know, have a mama to keep them warm. And so our brooder is basically our hen. And so, you know, we're going to try and keep those guys uh, at 95 degrees, you know, in that first week. Um, and then we can tail that temperature off depending upon your outside environment. So, uh, you know, keeping, keeping that, you know, uh, draft-free temperature in there, you know, is real important, you know, and typically after 14 days, these, they get a lot better at self-regulating. I think 21 days is like the magical point uh, if you have cold temperatures, um, but typically, you know, at least here in Florida, you know, 14 days were, were pretty, uh, pretty good. 
Dave, did you by any chance get that slide uh, with all my temperature and ventilation in? I do have the slide. I didn't add it yet. I, okay. I think I'm in the wrong presentation. I I, I uh, was logged under a different account when I added it. Sure. <laughs> but I, no, that's it's, fine. Um, uh, I, can I, add, I was say, thinking about adding that to the document section of the WUVA site because I felt like that would probably be really beneficial. Sure. Well, I, I'll just I'll just say if Dave loads that up, it's a it's a spreadsheet that I put together. As far as getting the temperature right, I think it's an art and a science. So I have a temperature log that I do the, the temperature that I adjust it to, and I have it broken down by each day what temperature I think they need. I would say it's also affected by humidity. Um, if the air is dry, it needs to be warmer. If the air is moist, it doesn't need to be as warm. Um, and I, you, you can look up charts that will tell you, you know, what temperature should be at any given humidity. Um, but it's an, that's the science part. But the art is if you walk in and the chicks are huddled up, they're too cold. Or there's a draft or there's a predator. But as is, is it applies to temperature, if you walk in and they're huddled up, it's, it's a temperature issue. And if they're running from the heat source, they're too hot. So I think it's important to understand the science as far as this is the temperature they should like given how old they are and given the humidity. But the art of it is, is being in tune with your chickens and recognizing, you know, sometimes they, they don't want exactly what the book calls for and making sure that you're in tune with them. Dave, you're- uh, Yeah, I just, I just realized that. <laughs> Step one, right? Mike, if there's any additional questions that you had uh, out there that looked like would be good for this part of the uh, presentation, go ahead and throw them. Yeah, I got two of them for you. Just picked them out. Um, kind of related to the, the air quality, the, the ventilation broader topic here. Um, first one, do you, do you have a recommendation for an automatic air exchange system? Um, and I know David Hale runs. runs yeah. um, and how do you measure that air exchange? Sure. So what I recommend for, for, temp, uh, for air exchange, now I think a lot of people are able to do it statically, just meaning that they don't have a fan, they can open a window and get enough air exchange for that. It, and some people do really, I, I think the number is about one or 200 chicks is when you need to change it over to the force air where you actually have a fan. But I was talking to Dave earlier as we were preparing for this and he does three to 500 chicks with static air just fine. So um but I use a forced air system. So I have a ventilation fan. You want it to be an exhaust fan, pulling air out of the building, pulling negative pressure, and then you'll need a place to let air in. I, I'm going to speak to forced ventilation because that's, that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, as you pull that air into the building, it needs to be able to come into the building in such a way that it does not create a draft. So if you think about that, and, and the uh, you saw, we have some slides in here that talk about how much air they actually need. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a catch 22, you need to bring in a lot of air, but you need to do it in such a way that doesn't create a draft. And so you, in mind, the ventilation happens sort of in the headspace, six feet tall, that's where the airflow is going to happen. And, and there's no draft at floor level. Um, also, it's important, and, and the reason for ventilation is you need to get the bad gases out. The primary driver on that, I believe, is carbon dioxide. If your bedding gets wet, then you have, you're have you going to have ammonia and you need to pull out. If your bedding isn't dry in good shape, usually the carbon dioxide is going to hit you first. And then, of course, you need to bring oxygen in. And then it's also how, how you keep things dry. You can also get a situation where it's too humid. The way I do it is I have a timer and I'll put in a pitch for somebody. The brand name is Torque, T-O-R-K. And I love this timer because I, um, I wish I had one here with me to show you. You can set the timer to about five minute cycles. Five minute cycles is what you want. And then you can run it a percentage of the time. And how you know how much you use is based on the CFMs of the fan. So I would get a good, good quality exhaust fan that's rated for, you know, outdoor use because it's going to get a lot of it's going to be in a dusty environment, perhaps wet, if it, as rain comes in the rains, you know, because it's going to need access to the outside of the building to blow out. Um, and, and you just look at the CFM rating of that fan. So let's say hypothetically it's 2,500 CFMs. And CFMs just stand for cubic feet per minute. So let's say you have 600 chicks in your brooder. And you know that those chicks need 
0.1 uh, cubic feet per minute per check, you would multiply that by the 600 and you would get that that batch as a group needs 60 cubic feet per minute. And then you would figure out what that is as a percentage. Do I need that fan to run 1% of the time, 3% of the time, 8% of the time? It's gonna change as the checks get older that you're gonna to need to reset that sort of, and that's what I would call minimum ventilation. Um, because that's happening even on a cold night, it's bringing in that set amount of air. That's the amount of air they need. And then I would also put a thermostat on that fan um, so that if it got too hot in there, it would bring in the cooler air and it would also work to, to keep the building cool from overheating. And I would run those in parallel, the timer and the, uh, the timer and the thermostat would run in parallel. So that's my, sorry, I, I took long, a long time on that, but that's my, my thoughts on the forced air ventilation. And how you would know how much air to bring in is based on the CFMs of the fan and the number of chicks, how many CFMs they need each, and then doing the math. Um, if you want to check yourself, I would recommend a uh, CO2 meter. Um, but if you, get, if you get the CFMs right, it should be good. And then forced air, I guess you would just use your nose and uh, keep an eye, you know, make sure you're not getting any smells. Okay, Mike, uh, David, that was great. Uh, that CFM document is actually, could be an hours of conversation, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, you know, and I just wanted to clarify, we do some forced air, uh, it just depends, but because of the way our brooders were designed and, uh, and of course being in Florida, we had the luxury of letting a lot of uh, airflow through the top layer of the brooder, which doesn't, you know, uh, disturb the chicks at the lower level. Uh, Mike, did you have any more that you want to throw at us or we want to continue on to uh, uh, types of brooders? Go ahead and types of brooders. And I think you'll hit the one question I have, which is uh, heater types, but you got about 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So we're going to move a little bit faster through this. Um, it's, this is a great topic and it's an extremely important topic. So this presentation will be available after the fact um, and of course a recording of this and, and then I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, so types of brooders, uh, a lot of ways you can go. Uh, in this case, uh, I've listed four major types that I consider. Uh, stick building, you know, lumber built. Everybody's built the little sheds. Uh, they work, they work great. Um, you know, it's probably the easiest thing to build. Uh, you know, especially if this is your first venue into it, a lot of times you can repurpose garden sheds uh, for brooders. I've seen that a hundred times and, you know, they, they work great. You know, that works good for uh, starting up. Uh, hoop style buildings. Uh, I've known a lot of farms to move into the hoop building uh, direction. Uh, we've done that on our farm. Uh, we're a little bit more than just a hoop. We, you know, our hoop structures are built on trailer frames. So all of our brooders at our farm are all mobile. Uh, but, you know, uh, hoop structures are very strong structures, in my opinion, just because of that, that hoop design. Um, and the coverings are really flexible. You know, I've seen people put, you know, gavelum or, you know, sheet metal on there. And I've also uh, seen people put tarps and, you know, all sorts of materials. You know, we use tarping uh, or panda plastic in our case. Uh, then we have the Connex Secret uh, brooders, you know, as you get bigger and you're really needing the square footage, you know, a 40 footer is 320 square feet. So, you know, you could brood, you know, six, 700 birds up to two weeks in there. Uh, so, you know, I, I've seen farms, you know, add half a dozen of these for brooding. And, you know, again, they're great for scaling. It can, you know, uh, it's a nice ready to go structure. There's some obviously startup cost. And if you're only starting off with 50 or 100 birds, you know, probably not a good starting point, but, you know, we'll cover that. Um, and also your existing structures, a lot of people have barns uh, in, in places that are draft free, even garages, you know, it doesn't really matter as long as you're fine with it, um, that can be easily adapted for this. And so, you know, the key to all these uh, structures here is, is your ability and access to infrastructure. So you can either A, use uh, power for heating, or you can use uh, propane for heating, uh, and or also access to water. So um, all these brooders will have their, you know, pros and cons. Uh, and ultimately, your farm and your environment is going to really dictate, you know, what you need to be worried about, what environmental variables you have to worry about. You know, in Florida, we have more to do with heat than we do cold, though, you know, we're running through the winter. I mean, this is our time of the year that we run. So we're brooding with outside temperatures in the low 20s, you know, so 
technically we're really dealing with more cold than most farms since most farms are running through spring and summer. And so, uh, you know, but we've been very successful with the hoop buildings with just plastic as insulation and the lower levels with wood. Uh, so that provides enough, you know, insulation from the out outside elements for us to control, you know, heat in our, in our environment with just IR lighting. Uh, and, you know, I'm gonna hop into the next slide here uh, and I'm gonna let Dave take this off. Dave, I have two slides here. This is the outside. Okay. And I'm gonna probably, you know, kind of go to the next slide, which is the inside, because I think there's more to explain there. But before I do that, why don't you go ahead and give a rundown of, of this brooder uh, that you have here, the outside at least, and then I'll move it. Sure, so the construction on this is, um, it's a, a drill stem, which is a fairly heavy steel base. I had some hoops bent, and then you can see I've just put the sheet metal on there. Uh, we did spray insulation inside. I think um, for us, insulation was pretty important. Uh, the first one, first one of these I used as a brooder, of course, it was just sheet metal. And I looked at the price of insulation and I said, well, uh, that's a lot of money for insulation. That'll sure buy a lot of propane. And I started using it without insulation and boy, I sure bought a lot of propane. Um, and so I saw pretty quickly that the insulation was a, a, a good investment for me in my climate. Um, in this picture that Dave is showing there, you can kind of see uh, in the other end of, it looks kind of like a cave, I guess, from this angle, but it looks there, you can see my exhaust fan in the back, kind of over the top of the two heaters. Back one topic, I would say the, the question of heating that Dave was talking about, I think there's two uh, schools of thought on heating a brooder. One is uh, kind of with the, like he talked about with the infrared lights, where you're going to put a heat source in the middle and the chicks, if the chicks cold, get cold, they can come closer to light. If they get, they get too hot, they can move away from the light. With a propane heater, the way I'm doing it, it's, it's considered a whole house. I'm going to heat the whole house to temperature. And so the, the, the heaters are running on a thermostat. They're going to bring it up to 90 degrees or whatever uh, the set point is that's right for those chicks and then shut off. And so I'm heating the whole house equally and evenly. There's a warm spot under the brooder, that's for sure, but they're off most of the time. And then, and then there's another way of thinking with sort of the centrally located heat source where there's gonna be a warm spot in the middle that they can move to and, and they can sort of regulate their own temperature based on where they need to be. You can see my little turbo feeders there. Those are a nice way of feeding chicks I found. And then I have two nipple drinker lines uh, down either side of the fin. Uh, you, you can see the bucket hanging in the back. If you kind of look under, it looks like it's right under one of the heaters. And that has a float valve in it that's going to give me uh, the correct. And, and it just gravity feeds from that bucket to the nipple drinkers. And you can see that the height of the bucket is only just a few inches over the level of the nipple drinkers. And that's because you only want about eight to 10 inches of water column pressure on those nipple drinkers. They need to have very, very low pressure. And um, that's how I achieved low pressure is just by just a little bit of gravity, so. David, what is the square footage of that brooder? Uh, this is uh, 450 square feet. Okay, so I, I saw a question that asked about the capacity and I asked the square footage on, on purpose just so we can reverse. So, you know, that, that brooder at two weeks could hold up to 900 to 1,000 chicks, you know, and that's based on the charts in the beginning of the presentation. Just wanted to mention that just so you guys can look at those charts and, and I'm gonna relay some of this back and forth. So these, these are common threads that you're gonna find in a lot of these brooder builds. Sure, and it's something else I would say, it may not look like it in this picture, but I can stand up comfortably in this brooder. That's something else important too. If you get, you need to be able to comfortably be able to get in and do what you need to do, uh, or at least that's a strong consideration anyway. There was another question here that, you know, considering, uh, Dave, that this is kind of enclosed without outside light, it'll obviously you're adding light to the brooder. Um, so Nick was asking about the length of day uh, that you provide for your chicks. And uh, Mike or Jeff, if you are on the, on the chat, you know, if there's a specific length of day that is good for chicks, in my mind, we kind of try to keep lights on for at least the first seven days for 24 hours. So these guys are encouraged to eat and drink. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to hand that over to you, Dave, just to see what you do on yours. Sure. So I think by the book would say that they should have full 24 hour light for the first three days 
Um, and then you would go to uh, 12, probably 16 hours would be ideal. I have to be honest in this, and I do have brooders with timers on their lights. I have to be honest in this particular brooder, I, they're on 24 hours a day, all three weeks they're there. And I haven't noticed any negative from that. They do still bed down at night and sleep. Uh, this is not a strong bright light in there by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's a fairly dim light. That's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, bright light is definitely a problem over stimulation. When we built our brooders the first time uh, with the hoop structures, we used a, a white and, and then some, you know, non-opaque plastics and uh, it was very bright in there. And we actually ended up having some major issues uh, just with chickens and, and, and uh, feather picking, things like that. Uh, that was, you know, definitely obviously signs of overstimulation. So, too much light is not good and the right light spectrum is even better. Uh, Jeff would probably say, uh, I think it was a 60% opaque green uh, plastic was, was good. Uh, maybe 70%, I have someone whispering in my ear. But anyways, uh, but yeah, lighting is real important. Uh, and also there was another question just further back about converting a garden shed uh, into a brooder. So obviously this is a very large brooder and not necessarily a beginner's brooder. Uh, garden sheds, uh, you know, probably on average are 10 by 10, 10 by 8, or 10 by 12. And uh, I think those are great, uh, you know, 100 square feet. So you're talking about, you know, being able to grow up to at least 200 birds in a shed lot size. Uh, so, you know, garden shed, I would examine that if you're, especially if you're repurposing it, I would examine it for any entry points for predators, rats. Uh, raccoons, anything like that. Uh, make sure that you seal those points of entry. And then I would also make sure uh, that there's no problems with, uh, you know, wind, breeze, uh, basically air disturbances in the lower two feet. Uh, and then of course have a plan for your ventilation and how to keep that guy ventilated, uh, you know, through grow out, especially if you're doing it uh, in a cold or hot time of the year with temperature extremes. Uh, but ultimately, those make for great brooders. I mean, easy to repurpose. Um, think about your flooring uh, and uh, how you want to seal that. Sometimes the wood would probably rot over time, depending upon how well you keep your, your bedding. Dave, if I could take a shot at a couple questions here. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about the ideal light spectrum for brooder houses. And I believe the answer on that would be the warmer the light, the better. I think 2700 is ideal. But I haven't noticed a huge, I don't think that's a huge issue. I wouldn't sweat it too much. But if you're going out to buy new bulbs, you want the warmer light. Question about uh, savings for insulation over propane. You have to, I'm rooting through the winter. So that, that's a pretty big deal. That's where insulation pays off for me. If you're just doing something, it's probably not as big of a deal. Or if you're in a, somewhere like me in Texas, um, during the summer, that heat can radiate down from the steel. So it's also helping me keep it cool in the summer from he keeping that sun, hitting the steel and radiating the, the heat down. Uh, this brooder was actually designed to be mobile. Um, I'm answering a question with that, but it ended up it ended up being stationary and we actually have gone back and we're trying a concrete floor under that to help see if that helps it clean up. Uh, Jerry's still out on, on um, whether the concrete floor is a good idea. And then wood chips for bedding, I, I, it's perhaps not the best, but if you get the right wood chips, it can it can be very, very, very good. I, wood chips are fine. Oh, have to start in February. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I don't know what part of the country you are in February, but in my part of the country, February is cold and I, I would recommend insulation for starting in February. And then, oh, back to the lighting also, we talked about the intensity of the light. I said dim light, but if the light is too dim, the chicks may not be able to find their way and around to feed adequately. So I don't think you want full sunlight kind of bright lights, but you don't want it to be so dim that they can't find the feed. When they first find that need feed, they, they need to be able to see the feed and see the shadow of the feed so that they can find it to pick, uh, to pick up and start eating. So I said dim light, but I just want to be clear, not, not too dim. Okay, uh, I'm gonna kind of move on to the next uh, style brooder here. Uh, technically, Dave and I have very similar style in that we both have hoop structures. Uh, 
ours is hoop frame on, on uh, trailer frames. And so uh, for a lot of reasons we do this, uh, you know, uh, honestly, I, I really like mobile brooding. Uh, the nice thing about it is we can put this wherever we need to put it. So if we're brooding chicks and we need to be able to hear them in the mornings, we can put them closer to the home. Uh, if they're getting older and they don't need to be around the house, we can move them out the field near the, the uh, shelters we plan to put them in. And so, uh, you know, there's some really big benefits, in my opinion, to putting your brooders on wheels if you can. And if you can, it's fine too, skids, whatever you got. Uh, but in our case, it's been a huge labor advantage, uh, especially with uh, cleaning bedding out. Uh, because I, you know, once we get the chickens out of the brooders, uh, we're basically bringing uh, the brooders to our compost piles, backing it right up, and you can either shovel or roll out with your bedding immediately into your compost, reset, and get started for the next batch. So uh, that, you know, bedding management is, is kind of a nightmare uh, for a lot of people, especially in fixed brooders. Uh, so you're either bringing a tractor to it or you're, you know, you're getting your bedding out somehow. Uh, so I, I really focused with our solution was to reduce the stress of the ticks going from the brooder to the shelters and then reduce the stress on the farmer and taking the bedding out. And so that was a real important uh, part of this design. Uh, again, ours is just a hoop structure with, uh, you know, greenhouse plastic. Uh, in this particular case, we're using panda plastic. And then I use a non-opaque plastic on the end so we can get some natural light in from the sun. Uh, this uh, picture on the left was a design I don't recommend. I used a, uh, a white plastic uh, that was, uh, you know, 60% transparent. And this ended up being way over stimulation for our chickens. So we now use a panda plastic, or they're also known as silage tarps, uh, our silage plastic. And that's black on one side and white on the other. So we get the heat reflectiveness during the summer. Uh, but it, you know, it, it keeps the, the, the lighting in there a lot better. So like that back wall would still be uh, a 60% a, uh, uh, opaque plastic of some kind. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the top of the, the roof there would all be a dark plastic. So, um, you know, again, uh, we're using uh, peat moss. Uh, it's very similar to David. You know, I have a mixture of heat sources in there. We use IR lighting. Picture on the right is an example of a 220 volt, uh, 3000 watt uh, Solaris light. Uh, and I get what we call the, the, the chicken donut, where you see the chickens kind of gathered in a circle. Uh, and that's to me is ideal because what's happening there is you have a, a heat source in the center uh, where it's the most hot and the chicks are able to self-regulate by the distance from the center. So uh, they can go in there temporarily, come back out and, and get at the heat, you know, and they again have great ability to self-regulate their heat based on what they need. So, you know, this mobile brooding is what we do on Pasture Life uh, Farm. And uh, this is how we, you know, we manage our chicks. Uh, and we have basically door access for the front and those brooders are about six feet tall. So we have plenty of room to walk around there. And there was a quick question on trailers. Uh, we like using the single wide mobile home frames for bases. Uh, they're very structural, they're, they're nice and heavy. So the lightness of the, uh, the hoop structure itself is not a, you know, a problem. So the trailer itself has a nice heavy frame to it. So it, the wind doesn't buffer it. Uh, but typically we see mobile home frames on the internet all the time. So we just snag them up as we see them. Um, we're, I know we're getting close on time. This is again, a, gosh, we could talk so long on this topic. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the next frame, Dave, uh, and just discuss another heat source. Uh, obviously you have propane. I use IR. Um, here's an efficient way of using incandescent heating. Uh, the Ohio brooder is a term that a lot of people use. I like to consider the Ohio brooder kind of like the mother hen, you know, is you have a, uh, here's a very large uh, brooding structure. Uh, we appreciate uh, 
uh, integrated farms, Chad and Dorothy provided this uh, picture of their breeding operation. And uh, as you see, it has a very large building, uh, metal building. And they brewed, I believe, uh, anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 at a time. So it's a pretty large operation. And, um, you know, but they can keep all these chicks warm with just 11 four by eight or higher brooders. And so these guys, you know, and there's three 175 watt bulbs per higher brooder. So, you know, their total power consumption is just about four or 5,000 watts for that many chicks in my mind is really good. So uh, Dave, I just kind of bouncing back and forth. I know again, we're gonna probably have a lot of great questions still left even and run out of time. Sure. Yeah, and I, I just uh, I just post I had a question about it. I posted a link to the timer I use into the chat if that's helpful to anybody. Um. Okay, so yeah. oh, go ahead, Mike. Yep, um, you got it. Just got a couple of minutes if you want to. Yeah, wrap let's. It up. Yeah, let's kind of wrap it up. Um, I think let's. If there's any uh, great questions sticking out, maybe we can hit those. Um, and then, of course, we can have some more uh, discussion, perhaps on a forum online. Yeah, I would. I would say here we got about two minutes, so I just want to. A couple people have been asking questions. Um, these are recorded. Dave and Dave will make their PowerPoint available and any handouts. We'll put them in the Whova session. Uh, there's also a Q and A session there in Whova. I think the guys hit most of those topics that were already started there, but you can continue this in the Q and A box in the, on this session on Whova. Um, there's one question I want to get your guys' opinion on here. So you get like 30 or 40 seconds to answer this question. <laughs> I've been experiencing quite a few um, deaths at eight to nine weeks with Cornish cross. Could that be attributed to poor ventilation in the brooder? So we, we blame a lot of things on the brooder, but what do you guys think about eight week, nine week old deaths? It is possible that inadequate ventilation in the brooder could cause ascites, which would, or ascites, which could pop up later. I would expect it. We've seen it more at six and seven weeks than eight and nine weeks. Yeah. But I, it's a very possible, but not for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would lean more towards feed for protein percentages at those uh, ages. If you're too hot on your feed in the beginning, uh, you know, ascites is definitely uh, a good potential cause of that. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it, yeah, I'm sorry, hot <laughs> protein or, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just slinging a term, but, uh, but basically protein is real important. So, you know, being at the right protein levels is probably going to help later, uh, uh, weeks. So, uh, you want to keep that protein lower to make sure you're not, uh, too high on protein going into, uh, if, you, if you plan to go that long, eight, nine, 10 day uh, weeks. Okay, um, we're gonna have to end it there. Did did you have something you wanted to say about this particular brooder? Uh, yeah, this Dave. is just a. Um, this was I, I pillaged this. Uh, Susan helped me pillage this off of the Appa groups. Uh, this is a fog lines uh, Connex brooder. Just so we had a picture of that, and they're as you can see, they're using propane heating, uh, and it looks like uh, they have their uh, their feed elevated uh, just to help prevent the chicks from eating. The feed out of the bedding so that's that's the step that some people like to take cool all right thank you dave and david um we could probably go another couple hours but uh, <laughs> easily <laughs> i have a feeling brooding will make its way into a topic on monday or tuesday it usually yeah does. i wouldn't doubt it so well we appreciate right. you guys for listening hopefully uh, you'll find this information valuable and we'll make sure that this uh, spreadsheet and especially David's some of David's more numbers are available aligns you to view them a little bit later yeah and I would just say that as we wrap up here <clears throat> some of the the geeky uh, ventilation stuff that David Hale was talking about is actually chronicled in the app of grit so if you're a member you can go to the member section and and dig through the last couple of years of the back issues and find them um, along with Dave Shields builds for his mobile brooder. Um, Great. So we're Hope in it's it. helpful everybody. Thanks so much.